you know, um, <clears throat> believe it or not, for this presentation, which is my fifth presentation today, I have no disclosures. And um, before I move into the body of the presentation, I want to point out one of my uh, IBD fellows just reminded me, for those of you who are on the AGA community forum, uh, there was recently a posting reg regarding advice for, from one of our colleagues whose pregnant Crohn's disease patient wanted to know whether she should eat her placenta following birth of her baby. So for those of you who want to see my reply, sign on to the post. So for today's alternative therapies, um, we're going to cover a few that I think I get asked about most commonly, minus the placenta, uh, naltrexone, fish oil, helminths, prebiotics and probiotics. I'm actually not going to cover fecal transplant because the next lecture is going to be about fecal transplant. I'm sure it's going to be better than mine. And then cannabis. Uh, so naltrexone. So what is it? So it's interesting. Naltrexone is a drug that blocks the body's opioid receptor. And it's the receptor, as you know, for morphine, heroin, and other wonderful things. And what is it used for? Well, it's slowing down or stopping up bowels after surgery, right, and, and uh, alcohol dependence. And uh, there's a question about whether it has any anti-inflammatory effects. And for those of you who may recall, Dorothy and everybody except for the Tin Man fell asleep in the poppy field. He just rusted because he was crying. So LDN, or low-dose low naltrexone, if you go to the internet, is claimed actually to be the cure-all. So be sure to <clears throat> buy some uh, while you're listening to my lecture. It's claimed to have a benefit in irritable bowel Crohn's disease, multiple sclerosis, fibromyalgia, depression, cancer, AIDS, and a few other things too. So what do we know for sure, at least at this point? Well, I could find a couple of published studies as well as an, an overall analysis. So the adult study, which was probably the first one we heard about, had 40 patients who got dose first placebo for 12 weeks with 4.5 milligrams per day. And the primary endpoint of clinical remission was seen in five patients who got the low dose naltrexone versus three who got placebo. So the findings were not statistically different and there were no SAEs. There was a pediatric study of 14 patients, their mean age was 12, ranging from eight to 17. They got 0.1 milligrams per kilogram per day for eight weeks versus placebo, and then they had some open label exposure, and their paper stated the differences did not reach statistical significance with no SAEs. And then the concrete analysis, which is the third uh, paper that I'm referring to, concluded based on the inf information they could review, there was insufficient evidence regarding the efficacy and safety of LDN in, in any active Crohn's disease. Moving on to fish oil. So as I told my patients, fish oil actually is not that fishy. Uh, if you look at the arachidonic acid pathway, which is the pathway which we believe that mesalamines and corticosteroids and perhaps some other anti-inflammatories work, it shifts uh, the body, you can see the ly ly lipostogenase inhibitors, shift the body from making LTB4, which is very inflammatory, to LTB5, which is a less inflammatory leukotriene. And there has been postulated and tested a potential role in maintaining remission in patients with IBD. <clears throat> in Crohn's disease, if you look through the various uh, studies, there's really little or no evidence of efficacy. The induction of remission does not been shown, neither is maintenance or steroid sparing. In ulcerative colitis, there is also little evidence, maybe a little better than Crohn's. Um, there is some weak data for induction of remission, but it was not statistically significant. There was no maintenance data, uh, and the steroid sp sparing data was weak and was not also, also statistically significant. This, fast, this lecture, as you see, goes quite rapidly. So as far as helminths, so helminths, as you know, are worms that stimulate the body's immune system to reverse the imbalance, seesaw of inflammation and, and no inflammation. And the um, question is, do we give worms or medicine? And, and I found this online. I put the um, site there, magictrickstore.net, right? It says, drop an instant worm into a glass and surprise someone you know. I don't suggest you do that, at least not the bar later tonight. So what is the theory? Well, we know that helminths have evolved with humans over tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of years. And they are cytokine mimics. They um, have other effects of um, fooling the dendritic cells and blocking um, 
MHC class two recognition and can affect TH2 and T regulatory cells. We think that's how they have adapted to live in, in I don't want to say our guts, but our guts. And as you know, the hygiene hypothesis has noticed that parts of the world where there's a lot of autoimmune diseases, if you see the map in red and a little yellow, are different where you than the parts of the world where this, there's a lot of um, helminthic infections. So the uh, equatorial regions have uh, more uh, infectious diseases. It's called the hygiene hypothesis, and maybe helminths were the reason why. There was a very nice study done by the group at University of Iowa that was presented at DDW in uh, 2004, I believe, and then published in 2005 where patients who had active, chronically active ulcerative colitis were randomized to drink 2,500 Chakur suis, the pig whipworm, eggs, or placebo. And there was charcoal to mask whether they were drinking the eggs or not. And um, you can see the 12-week response rate was 43% of those who took the ova versus 17% who had placebo. And then they crossed over them, the, the people to the other arm. And um, you can see that those who um, Initially got placebo, got the worm eggs, and those who didn't, uh, who got the worm eggs, got the um, placebo. And you can see the 12-week response rates. Overall, about half of patients who got some exposure to the whipworm eggs um, improved versus just 15% of those um, with placebo. Uh, uh, Crohn's disease, the, the, the trials done by the same group were just open label. And open label, as you know, in Crohn's disease, everything works, even eating your own placenta, where you see that response and remission rates were exceptionally high, better than any other drug that we, we have. So um, subsequently, um, there was a moratorium for a while on use of this. Uh, more recently, we did have some NIH studies looking at the use of helminths. I don't believe that we had the full results out yet. And there's been a lot of interest in prebiotics and probiotics. And just so you understand, the prebiotic is the food for the probiotic. And again, I downloaded this from a website, allergiesandyogurt.com, because uh, I thought it was a cute cartoon. But I think it really explains what, what prebiotics are. So we have uh, known from Dan Podolsky and Balfour Sartor and many other people uh, who done these experiments that if you have um, at least mice who are raised germ-free, um, who are destined genetically, knockout mouse, to get colitis. They don't get colitis if you keep them in a sterile environment, but once you expose them to bacteria, they get colitis. And um, the thought is, well, maybe if you had good bacteria, that would prevent that from happening. So prebiotics is the food for specific organisms, uh, and, the produ and it's measured, uh, you measure the production of butyrate and lactate by fermentation. So for example, there are many carbohydrates resistant to, to digestion, and they are listed there, found in foods such as bananas, Jerusalem artichokes, in this case anyone starting a garden, chicory, garlic, onions, tomatoes, and regular artichokes. So this is studies using germinated barley food stuff, a prebiotic, 18 patients with mild to moderate ulcerative colitis, placebo controlled, and um, there was a greater decrease in the clinical activity index in the patients who got the germinated barley food stuff with no side effects. And they did show increase in fecal concentrations of bifidobacter and eubacterium. Distal uh, short-chain fatty acids, uh, I mean short-chain fatty acid enemas in distal ulcerative colitis, 103 patients with left-sided ulcerative colitis, but more than just proctitis, got short-chain fatty acid enemas or placebo for six weeks, double-blinded, open-label extension. Unfortunately, there was no overall benefit seen. I think the numbers were 40% versus 33%, which wasn't statistically different. Um, but patients who had shorter duration of colitis and who, who held the enemas better did do better. And open label extension, they did have improvement in two thirds of patients, clinically and histologically. So there may be something to this, just not shown in the, in the primary endpoints of the study. Another uh, agent um, is, in case you're shopping later today, is Plantago ovata seeds, 105 patients in remission for ulcerative colitis. They actually got the seeds or mesalamine or both, and they, their uh, endpoint was 12 month remission maintenance. And unfortunately, there was no overall benefit, the maintenance of remission in that graph, the best was by mesalamine, um, and the lowest level was actually by the Plantago Ovato, but I don't think statistically it was different. 
So moving on to probiotics, right? So those are the organisms that we talked about, and we, we know that they're important for development of the innate human, uh, immune response. Um, and there's a combination of bacterium and or yeast and perhaps others. And you actually, if you want to get very fancy, you can market or, or get symbiotics. And symbiotics, S-Y-N, not S-I-N, that was from the uh, Las Vegas uh, meeting we had. The symbiotics are a combination of the prebiotics and the probiotics. So this study with Crohn's disease looked at a very common probiotic, lactobacillus, GG versus placebo. Um, if you see the bottom left, there was no benefit. Sorry, these slides aren't that easy to see, um, and they're not behind me. I guess I'm behind myself. Uh, were maintenance of remission or time to relapse. And then there was a post-operative prophyl prophylaxic study where patients had a Crohn's resection and were randomized to lactobacillus or placebo, and there was no difference between lactobacillus in yellow or placebo in purple in a percent of patients in remission. Uh, so in uh, World War I, there was a, a soldier in the German trenches who, unlike all of his other soldiers, never got her horrible dysentery, and they cultured the, uh, his stool, and uh, you can buy this as a uh, probiotic called E. coli Nissel 1917, and this has been studied for many years in, in trials. This is a Crohn's colitis trial. Patients were, all of everyone got steroids until they got better, then tapered their steroids, and they were randomized to placebo or to E. coli Nissel 1917. And um, the remission rates actually with the patients who got the um, Placebo were better than those who got the E. coli, so it did not help in that. Uh, the relapse rates, though, uh, were when those who got the E. coli were 33%, while those who got placebo were 63%. So there was some benefit in preventing relapse. Um, the mean dose of prednisolone, the patients who got the um, E. coli was lower. Um, and the relapse rate after you got off the prednisolone was also lower. It was 30% versus 70%. So this one, while it did not help induce remission, it actually had less chance of relapse. So there is some data into that. You're probably most familiar with pouchitis uh, prevention. Um, the one that's been studied by far the most and with the best quality studies is the VSL number three, which I am not, I, I do not have a conflict. I don't speak for them. Um, and this was a nice trial that was published in gastroenterology where 40 patients who had chronic relapsing pouchitis, at least three relapses within a year, um, were first given ciprofloxacin and rifaximin, put into clinical and endoscopic remission, and then randomized to get the VSL3 or the placebo. Um, and the remission at the end of the trial um, was quite um, much better in the patients. Um, uh, 17 of the 20 who were on the VSL3 were in remission. Uh, while only uh, well, none of the patients who got placebo were in remission. So this was probably the best trial we saw for VSL number three or any probiotic in pouchitis relapse um, prevention. And here you can see the survival curves of the relapse of VSL three, much better than placebo. And they also showed that the bacteria coming out in the stool from the pouch had the bacteria that were given in the probiotic. So that did show a success. And then another study with the same ag agent, VSL number three, looked at patients who had an ileal pouch for ulcerative colitis, and they were randomized before they ever got pouchitis to the VSL3 or placebo for a year. And normal pouch after a year was seen in 60% of the patients on placebo, but 90% of the patients on the probiotic. So personally, I, if I have patients who are destined to get pouchitis because of PSC or P anchor positive, I suggest that they might want to use this study as a guide, although those patients were probably excluded from their clinical trial. Cumulative rate of pouchitis was lower with the VSL number three. Pouchitis disease activity index was better with the VSL three. So here's a summary. So if you take a picture of any slide, you take it of this one, of prebiotics and probiotics and IBD. In Crohn's, weak to no data for prebiotics, weak data for probiotics. Ulcerative colitis, weak to no for prebiotics, weak for probiotics, but per pouchitis, the strong ones for patients for pouchitis prevention um, or relapse prevention with at least the VSL number three uh, probiotic uh, has two very good studies. So um, this, I told you that I was going to skip over the fecal transplant part um, because we're going to have the next speaker speak about this. I get a lot of questions about this and uh, about who was the inspiration um, for the pose for this. And many of you may have recalled the very, very early sessions of this meeting. 
uh, and I vouched re re revenge. So we did find out who was the inspiration uh, for this, <laughs> and you can direct all questions to my partner, Dave Rubin. Um, I'm going to skip over all the data for this because the next lecture is about fecal transplant. And then finally, uh, medicinal marijuana or cannabis. Um, this has been not well studied, and, and in reality, you couldn't study it because we weren't allowed to, <laughs> you know, and still it's federally it's not allowed, uh, but many states have passed legislation and it seems that they're letting people be, at least now. We'll see what happens if, if anything changes with the new administration. Um, and this study, which was published in Inflammatory Bowel Disease, uh, which is a journal you all should subscribe to by becoming members of CCFA, did show symptomatic relief but actually had a worse disease prognosis in patients with Crohn's disease, although we suspect it's because that's why they were taking the cannabis, because they had a potentially worse prognosis. It was a survey, 17.6% used cannabis, for, and it helped improve their abdominal pain, their cramping, their, their pain overall, and diarrhea. Um, but it, I, what I bolded is that um, it was, seemed to be a predictor for surgery for Crohn's disease, odd ratio of five which is quite high, and even if you controlled for smoking, time since their IBD diagnosis, biological use and uh, biologics use and demographics. So um, you may get a lot of questions from your patients. I do want to point out that in Illinois, which is one of the states where they added Crohn's and uh, ulcerative colitis to the list, they, they tell you you're not prescribing it, but the form that you have to sign, if you choose to sign, basically says that you are taking responsibility and that you have provided the patient with counseling and explain to them all the potential risks of taking cannabis. So be careful what you sign. There's a lot of lawyers who are unemployed in this country right now. So strength of evidence for, uh, as a summary, naltrexone is weak, fish oil is weak, um, helmets possible, we did see some stuff, needs more study for sure. Probiotics and prebiotics is weak except pouchitis prevention and relapse prevention. Um, fecal transplant, there is some data, and it's going to be covered in the next lecture. Cannabis, unfortunately, for, or maybe fortunately, weak to none. And then, as typically, when I give talks and presentations, I always close with a picture of my children. Thank you very much for your attention and for this whole week. Thank you.